Matthew chapter 23, 23, the Bible says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, the Bible reads. Turn with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. There you'll find in Deuteronomy 32, the Bible records the first of the records of the word faith in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32, in verse 20, the Bible says, And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, children in whom there is no faith. What a charge here to the people of Israel. It begins in this passage, a very present uh, reality that Israel is facing, um, almost foretold way back when. In verse 18 it says, Of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them, because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them, I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, children in whom there is no faith. That rock that formed them, obviously, is Christ. They're unmindful of the God that formed them. And therefore, God had no choice but to abhor them, because there was no faith in them. Do you want to be abhorred this day of God? Well, have no faith. Why, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Without faith, we're condemned already. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. The Bible says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And this same passage, this same quotation is, is recorded many times, but we know it in the New Testament in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. We know it in Galatians chapter 3, and we also know of it in Hebrews chapter 10. The just shall live by his faith, for the just shall live by faith. The only way to be just before God is through faith. The Bible is clear here. It says, He that lifts up his own soul. He that lifts himself up is not upright, but rather the just. Those that are justified live by his faith, and that's faith in Christ. And these are the only two examples we have in the Old Testament of the word faith being reckoned. Uh, do we now then give the Pharisees a clean pass? You know, based on Matthew 23, they had omitted the weightier matters of the law, and it would appear that perhaps this wasn't so weighty of a matter. But the reality is, is that faith also is represented in the whole of scriptures 247 times. And I submit to you, it's not something that is so scarce. It's not something that is so um, unaccounted for in the Old Testament as it would seem just because that exact word is not mentioned. But we do see the two parallels. We see that, that without faith, it is impossible to please Him. We see that main downfall of them, as I said in uh, Deuteronomy 32, is that they are children in whom is no faith. They were expected to have faith, else why would God charge them so harshly for not having it? Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith, Habakkuk records. And the same thing, the Old Testament, I submit to you, proclaims as many a time, that yea, the just shall live by faith. Faith is something that God expects in the Old and New Testament. If you turn to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, <clears throat> The New Testament really kicks off hard with this, this same vein, the same idea that faith indeed is the victory that overcomes the word. Faith is so important that it is one of the weightier matters even mentioned here to the religious folks. It is one of the weightier matters that is charged that she ought to have done these things, to have faith. Matthew chapter 6, the Bible reads in verse 25, uh, wrong page here. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? 
Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye little of faith? The provision here of God is being highlighted. We're to trust, we're to have faith in the provision of God. What is this faith? Well, it's to simply exactly what I just said. It's to put your trust in something, in an attribute of someone else. But what better way to use your faith than to put your trust upon the God that provides everything? I mean, these things that we look at, hey, adding a cubit to your stature. How about uh, providing for the lilies of the field? How about um, just providing the meat that comes to you in due season? The food that is provided to the fowls? These are all things that if you're to put your faith in a man to provide for you, if the creation was to put their faith in men to provide it for them, it would fail. And yet these things are lifted up as something that you ought to have because Christ follows up this whole dissertation by asking, Oh, you little of faith, are you not much more than they? Are you not much better than they? Wherefore, if God does all of these things to creation, if he provides all of these things for creation that doesn't even have the ability to reach out to him in faith, would you not think, would you not believe that God would provide this for you even? Think not on these things, O you little of faith. We're to be faithful and trust in his provision. Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8. The Bible reads in Matthew chapter 8, and verse 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. We know that right before this, Jesus had said, hey, let us go into the other side. The word of God was that we would pass over into the other side. And yet as soon as the storms came in, as soon as the tempest set in, as soon as the waves came up over the ship, the disciples cried out, Lord, save us, we perish. And Christ again condemns them as if, guys, where's your faith? The word proceeded out of my mouth was that we would cross. And now you're so fearful as if we would sink. We're not to be faithless in the area of the trust of God's care. We're to trust in God's care for us. And also his word. When God says it, it's established. It's sure. It's, it's nailed down. It's not going to waver. It's not going to fall. God's word was that they would cross over, and yet in an act of faithlessness, they cried out to God and said, Hey, God, let us pass over. Well, God had already promised such a thing. We need to be more like those that are commended for their faith. We don't need to be wavering and doubting whether God's going to provide for us. We don't need to be wavering and doubting whether God's going to care for us. Look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 10. The Bible says, And Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith. No, not in Israel. The response that Jesus just made was to a centurion, was to an unbeliever, was to a, a man that was a, a heathen man. And yet, he understanding that Christ was king, he understanding that Christ ruled over men, he understanding what Christ's position was, compared it to himself. And he says, hey, Lord, um, I'm not worthy that thou shouldst come unto my roof, but speak the word only in verse 8. And he understands this. His understanding is shown. He says, I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh. And the, by extension, he's saying, hey, I am under an authority as well. And my boss says, go, and I go. And I understand how this works. And it seems that this centurion, uh, something had happened in his life whereby he came to an understanding of who Christ was, and he knew that Christ provides for the lilies. He knew that Christ provides for the fowls of the air. And yet, he, and so he says, hey, I don't even need you to come under my roof, roof just speak 
the word. And this is a lesson that the disciples just had had failed on, had faltered in. Just a few pages, a few passages over, a few Bible verses over. We need to be one of those that is is looked at as having so great a faith. And this great faith isn't something that should be a great leap and a bound for a Christian. By the way, we're saved by faith. We, our, our, our faith is the vehicle by which God provides us salvation. So we took that step when we were, we were completely ignorant of scriptures for the most part. We had a few lines down. We knew kind of um, the, the picture of who Christ was. But the finer details, the, the whole of the scriptures, I mean the, the great doctrines of the faith, we, we, knew, we knew those not. The great faith is the one that we put on Christ to have him save us. And, and why would it be so shocking for us to now say to him, Speak the word only, and my servant shall be here. Speak the word only, and it shall be done. I'm trusting you, God. I'm trusting your word. And that is the faith that is commended. That is the faith that God just loves to see. That is the faith indeed that pleases him. Psalm 124 verse 8 says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. When you grasp the gravity of that, God that created all things, when you understand that your help is in him, why be faithless? Why doubt? Why worry? Why ponder on whether or not there's care for you? Why worry about whether or not you'll be provided for? Just trust him. He made the heaven and the earth and he promises that he loves you and continues to love you. You're one of his sons. You're one of his daughters. Look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Saying, There it was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she worry me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? God is looking for that faith that continually comes. We don't come to God with the same petition. We don't come to God with the same asking, with the same request, with the same desire for supplication from Him. We come to Him not in those manners, not repeatedly and not time after time, again, because we're doubting. We come to Him because, hey, it's something that He promised. God wants us to pray always. So when we continually come, just like the lady here did to the unjust judge, God will avenge speedily, even more so than the unjust judge. The unjust judge is just doing it because he's annoyed. God is doing it because he loves you and cares for you. And yet he wonders at this time, will I find faith in the earth? When the Son of Man cometh, will I even find the type of faith that is just crying unto me daily, asking repeatedly, desiring to commune with me, trying to get a hold of me? That faith, that trust, that asking of God is something that the Christian is required to do daily, that the Christian is required to do on a regular basis. Why? Because he wants to hear from you. Now, some of us will say, oh, well, God isn't answering me because such and such, because I did this, because I did that. I think the real reason why God is not answering these prayers at a specific time is, is, is not, um, see, our understanding would be that, hey, God is delaying. But the Bible's clear. It says, God will avenge speedily. So, his frame of reference for time isn't necessarily the same as frame of reference for mine. Remember what the Bible said in Daniel, how the angel was bidden to go and answer the prayer instantaneously, and yet there was this spiritual battle going on. And this is what I believe happens, and why God requires and why God demands that, just as to the unjust judge we repeatedly ask. We repeatedly ask. Just like Daniel, I believe, was repeatedly asking, repeatedly asking, trying to get revelation, trying to get a prayer answered, 
trying to hear from God. The reason why I believe he was doing that was because in doing so, he is taking part in a spiritual battle. He is taking part in that warfare that was happening. And though the angel that was sent to answer the prayer was hindered, I believe that the prayers which constantly come to God help. I believe that the prayers which constantly come have the avenging come speedily in our frame of reference. God answers those prayers immediately. God answers the prayer of faith like that. But there's more to this battle. There's more to this fight than meets the eye. We need to resolve ourselves to persevere in prayer and do it in faith. Because the Bible is clear in so many places that when you ask, you're answered immediately. But I think sometimes we ask, it's answered immediately, and then after that day passes, or that trial passes, or that strife passes, we just stop asking. Oh, it'll work itself out. Oh, God. Well, well, we've just dropped out of a battle that's going on, and perhaps even the angel that's sent to answer that prayer for you is like, well... You know, I was going, I was going in this fight. Maybe he gets sidetracked. Maybe he sent somewhere else. Maybe you have just proven that that what was hurting you at the time wasn't really bothering you that much. That which was you were struggling with at that time didn't really bother you that much. We need to be fervent in our prayers. You want your prayers answered? Go to God daily. Go to God hourly. Go to God moment by moment by moment with that same petition. Join in the battle in faith. Verse 35. Look at verse 35 of that same chapter. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. So he'd already been begging, right? This is where he was stationed. This is what he was doing. And he was just begging those that would pass by. And hearing the, and hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. So he knew that there was more people coming by than usual. Perhaps he was actually getting more more bang for his bag. He was actually receiving more, more offerings at that time. And he's like, what in the world is going on? I hear this great multitude. They're giving more to me. This is great. What's going on? They told him, verse 37, that Jesus of Nazareth passes by. And he cried saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out so much the more. The son of David, have mercy on me. Isn't it amazing that when someone cries out to God in prayer, when someone seeks him to help, just how fast the, uh, the scoffers come in and they say, ah, hold your peace, hold your peace, let it go. He, he's got busier, he's got more important things to do. He's got better things to do than to answer this, this cry out. But yet, and you don't find this so often in the Bible, he cries out, thou son of David, calling him as a son of David, understanding that, that he is of the lineage to be king, but also understanding, as the Bible explains it, that he is the son of David. He is in that lineage of kingship, and though at the time there was actually no king in Israel, he says unto him, Have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, what wilt thou that I do unto thee? What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people. When they saw it, gave praise unto God. To God several times, again, coming to him repeatedly in faith. This man went from begging any man that would pass by to very specifically calling out to Jesus, thou son of David. It almost seems like he couldn't be more specific in addressing God at the time, in addressing Jesus Christ as he passed by. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And in doing so, he gets a hold of him. Jesus stood and he stands before him and simply just asks him, what shall I do unto thee? And the man asks, that I may receive my sight, and immediately he does. And he glorifies God, and he's excited, and he's running with the people. Through faith, this man, through asking repeatedly, through trying to get a hold of God, through finally begging that he would come near unto him instead of begging unto man to just help him get through the day, he says, God, uh, that I would receive the impossible. God, that I would receive sight that I have never had before. God, that I would see for the first time. And Jesus says, that thou wilt, thy faith has saved thee this day. We as Christians are to increase in our faith. We're to persevere in our faith. And if anyone knows anything about, about working out, about exercising, it is increased by doing more of it. If you want to be able to do 100 push-ups, you've got to start by doing 10 push-ups. 
Right? You need to get to the point where your muscle builds up. And faith, I believe, is the same thing. You need to build your faith. And perhaps this is why God allows and seeks for and asks us to just repeatedly be in these activities that require our faith. He purposely leaves us somewhat in the dark, seeing through a glass darkly, so that we would exercise our faith and our faith would become stronger. I don't know about you, but I don't plan on having the same amount of faith today as I do 20 years from now. I don't have the same amount of faith now as I did soon after I was born. Yeah, I believe God calls that a great faith. God calls that a wonderful faith. Why? Because at the time, I just had a grain of mustard seed of faith to offer Him, and He gave me eternal life. He gave me salvation. He gave me the greatest gift of all because I reached out to Him with that little bit of faith I have. And yet now, today, and more and more and more each day, I pray that God would allow me to increase my faith. And I understand that that will come with some trials. Look at Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 and verse 4. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So those doubting apostles, those doubting disciples are now, are now starting to act out the faith that they're expected to. And I, I believe that it's because of the great things that happened in Pentecost, the great things that they have seen. They saw the Lord rise again. Now they're just on cloud nine. They are just full of faith. Yes, some doubted and some fell by the wayside. The Bible says they're a sheep of, with no shepherd. They're scattered abroad. And yet at this time, they, we see them now fastening their eyes upon a certain lame man from his mother's womb. A certain man that they all understood that was always at the temple at the hour of prayer. He was always there at the ninth hours. He was always seeking alms. He was always asking for the same thing. And they knew that he was in that state, in the gate, which is called beautiful, for years and years and years, for as long as they had known him, and for as long as indeed he had lived. Yet they look upon him and they say, Silver and gold have we none. But in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And this happens. And I don't think the disciples here were surprised. I think they had seen great miracles happen. They understood that they were now walking in the power of God and the power of the Holy Ghost. And they were simply just by faith acting out, by faith healing lame men, by faith healing those that are, are sick. And yet Peter still finds it necessary to stand up. Look at verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The people didn't understand what had just happened. The people looked at the apostles as if they had done some great miracle. And so the apostle Peter is now preparing to preach this sermon where he clarifies it. He begins by saying, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers. The beginning of his speech, the beginning of his sermon, his oration is, The God of Abraham. And he continues on and he starts to just explain to these people that, hey, there's nothing in me. But he says in verse 16, And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. The faith in God is what gave the man this perfect soundness. Believing in God, believing on God, trusting Him to do exactly as we had request of, requested of Him was there. It was immediate. It was at their disposal. Why? Because God was upon them at that time and just ready to preach, just ready to teach, and just ready to heal, and just ready to do His work. So this isn't the only mention, uh, as we see. In the Old Testament, we see two mentions. And though they are only mentioned two times, this same faith is reiterated and reverberated consistently throughout Bible history. We see that just in this portion when Peter starts to explain to them the faith that healed these men. The first thing he does is says the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He appeals back to the great fathers, the great men of the faith in past. And he says, this same God has healed this man by faith. He's pointing the two to the same act. He's pointing to the same reach in faith. Look to Romans chapter 4, if you would. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, and I hope when people are, are confused at times to, to what it means to act out in faith, what it actually means 
to be faithful. And even in the Old Testament, I, I, I think often we can use Romans chapter 4 with um, you know, perhaps a Jew or perhaps a, um, an is Islamic person. When you go to Romans chapter 4, you're going to find right away that appeal back to the Old Testament scripture. Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, the Bible says, For what saith the scripture? Now he's not talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, though those would appeal too, but he says, What saith the scripture? And he appeals all the way back to Genesis chapter 15. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So there we have faith in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 15. Though at the time it wasn't that exact word faith, it was simply a believing God, trusting God. God trusting the word that God revealed unto him. That's faith. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So the opposite of this faith would be working. The opposite of the grace of God acted through faith is, a, is work. And that's a debt. That's, that's receiving something for the work you have put. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Here it is. His faith is counted for righteousness. And I believe that this same faith was acted out and righteousness was received. And as you read down there, you're going to find this statement said over and over and over again. Verse 9 says, Cometh this blessedness upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. And the same thing in verse 11, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had, the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So it seems that many believed at this time. Many had the righteousness of faith. And it was the same faith that Abraham acted out when he believed God and had righteousness imputed unto him. Verse 14 says, For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. So that the law of righteousness, the righteousness which is through faith, is the exact opposite of fulfilling the law. If the people that fulfill the law, if the people that did the work are made heirs, then faith is made void. And we know that faith can't be made void because faith is the, is the vehicle by which anyone is saved. And therefore, in verse 16, it concludes, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to those, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. It continues down, just explaining that he staggered not. This was the act of Abraham. In verse 19 it says, He being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. So the truth is that his body is not dead, but he doesn't consider that. He is not weak in the faith. When he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So conceiving this seed, conceiving that child, was impossible by the standards of men. Just like seeing as a blind person was impossible by the standard of men. But in verse 20 it says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to. To perform, And that's ultimately a great definition of what faith means. Being fully persuaded. Being fully encapsulated. Being fully on board with the belief that what God promised, he is able to perform. And Abraham was a great example of this. Because even as we read through the scriptures, it seems like the details were a little bit hazy to Abraham. It was just go and he went. It was just trust and he went. It was just offer thy son and he did. Consistently, Abraham just simply believed the word of God and followed through. Sometimes only looking back to a promise that was made many years ago. He trusted God by faith. He was fully persuaded that what God promised, he was able to perform. And look at chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith. There it is. The just shall live by faith. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith unto this grace, wherein we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So the peace of God, that peace that passeth all understanding, 
comes when we're not worried about where our next meal comes from. It comes when we're not worried about the storms of life. It comes when we're not worried about what we're going to wear, when we're, when we're worried about what we're going to do, when we're worried about all these finer details, these struggles, these trials, when we're worried about how other people are going to react to what we do. We are released from that bondage. We are set free. The peace of God comes when we're justified by faith, when we're acting in faith. We also have access to the grace that we stand in, and we now have the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, and here it is, we glory in tribulations also. Can you imagine turning your worries, your struggles, your strife, your, 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 your pains, your anguish into glorying? Turning that tribulation into glorying? Why? Because you know that that tribulation is going to work patience, as the Bible says. Not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience and experience hope. What did I say about faith earlier? That faith is a muscle. Faith is something that we need to work on. We need to build. We need to get stronger in. The disciples themselves said, Lord, give me more faith. Lord, all that my faith would grow. And God's promise is true. He says, yes, through faith, here is the peace. Here is the grace. Here is the ability to stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The greatest gift, the greatest end to any life is that you will see Christ. And he says, though, there will be tribulations. You'll glory in those also. Why? Because that tribulation will work patience. That patience will work experience. That experience will work hope. And when you experience, when you receive, when you have that hope, and when you're placing it on God, it's just this reciprocal abiding where God is giving you peace. He's giving you grace, yet you're going through trials and tribulations. And then you trust Him through them. And then you come back down and you're in another trial and a tribulation. And you trust Him through them. And then the more this repeats, the more patience you receive, the more experience you get, the more hope you have in the living God. And that allows you to be so much more as a Christian. It allows you to be so much more in glorifying God. It allows you to be so much more to help your neighbor. And that ultimately is our, our, our final end. Look, look at Christ. Look at how Christ went and he helped. He did good wherever he went. And the first thing that the apostles did, when they were full of faith, when they finally had the Holy Ghost upon them, and they received that promise, the first thing that they did was they took that faith, they took that trust in God, and allowed it to be a blessing upon others. I just want to finish up in Hebrews chapter 10. This portion of scripture is awesome. Um, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, the Bible says, Now the just shall live by faith. Remember we started there. The just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in. In other words, if anyone draw back into unbelief. As a Christian, we can draw back into unbelief. We can get to the point where we're now doing everything on our own. Where we're now fighting our own battles. Where we're now not trusting God to get us through, but we're trusting self to get us through. You know, I could stand up here every day and in my own power, I could preach a sermon. And there would be no power in it. It would just be Josh talking about the things of God. I can draw back and not have faith. Or I can be just and live by faith. That's where God's pleasure is. He has pleasure in those who live by faith. He has pleasure in the just. But we are not of them that draw back under perdition, but of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. So there's no reason why someone that believes unto the saving of the soul should draw back, though it does happen. There's no reason that we should. Why? Because we've believed to have our soul saved. That's the greatest miracle you can ever imagine. Man, God's greatest creation, being reunited with Him in heaven because we simply believe on Him to get us there. Why, why, why would we doubt in the little things that happen afterward? Why would we doubt in receiving the 20 bucks you need to put gas in your tank? When God saved your soul, God did the greatest miracle of all, and now we're worrying about, about um, how we're going to get you know, 20 bucks to, to feed ourselves. God saved your soul, he's taking you to heaven. It's the greatest miracle ever. Why would we draw back into unbelief? It, it's, it doesn't make any sense, Christian. It doesn't make any sense, believer. We are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We're not of them that draw back into perdition. God promised that, but we can draw back to just destruction of our life. We can draw back to where God would have no pleasure with us, but it doesn't even make sense to abide there. You're free from those things now. Now look in chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is something that is the evidence of things not seen, the Bible continues. There is a substance that is hoped for. Something that is not seen. Something that is not necessarily tangible because you're looking forward to it. And then it's there again, the evidence of things not seen. So if somebody is looking to believe once they see, it ain't happening because we believe by faith. And 
That is an evidence that is simply not seen. And here it is. For by it the elders can obtain a good report. By it those Old Testament saints. Remember I said that there is only two references in the Old Testament to the word faith. But God here is highlighting the fact that, hey, faith was not something void in the Old Testament. Faith was not something that was unheard of. It was believe God. It was trust God. It was believe and, and, and do and, and follow and, and, and God will do the same provision that he does for us. It's just a different word. It's a different explanation. We don't see faith that often. But those who had no faith in them were condemned. And the just shall live by faith. It's one of the greatest statements of the Bible. And it's made in the Old Testament. Through faith, verse 3, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. And this is contrary to most of our understanding. If anyone's a builder, if anyone's a manufacturer, then you take things that you see and you frame. You take things that you see and you make them into something. But here it's very clear that the action of faith, the, the, the building of the world, the, the, the faith even of God as he created the world, is that we understand, we understand that through faith, we understand that God made everything out of nothing. We can trust Him to provide for us. Look at this. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. That's next unto the first man ever, ever upon earth, right? We have Abel. By faith, Enoch, very early in the Old Testament, was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It continues down in verse 31. It says, By faith, the harlot Ahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. What shall I more say? We know that in the middle there, for lack of time, we're just going to skip over that, but it's just Abraham, it's Joseph, it's Jacob, it's Moses, it's Moses' parents. It's all these who acted by faith on a word revealed by God to do according to God's will, simply trusting that in the end, if they believe God, he will perform it. If they believe God, he will finish the work. And here it says in verse 32, what shall I more say? I mean, the writers of, writer of Hebrew is saying, I could say more. I could talk more and more and more and more about how the Old Testament saints acted in faith. There is no excuse then for these Pharisees to not to omit this weightier matter. There's no excuse for the Pharisees to pass by this and just be concerned about the tithe, just be concerned about the outward show. This is a weightier matter even in the Old Testament. They need to understand. What shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and rocks of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. The accumulation of the faith that was acted out in the Old Testament was the revelation that came through the New Testament, through the blood of Christ, through the finished work on the cross, through the full understanding, the full giving, the full offering of the Holy Ghost upon His people, the abiding of the Holy Ghost within those, the, the full promise, the full perfection was made through that atoning event 2,000 years ago, and we now get to receive that promise. We now get to live in that. And so we look back and we see that the Bible is clear. Faith was being applied. Faith was being worked out. Faith was being 
exercised. They were being tried. They were using faith toward God in the Old Testament. And now we, how much the more? We have received something better. We have received something bigger. We have the Holy Ghost abiding in us. How much more can we now act out in faith? Should be no excuse for us. We should be able to trust God unto the uttermost. We should be unmovable. We should be in unity as a church. We should not doubt. We should not waver. We should go forward, press towards the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because they acted in faith through a glass dark. They acted in faith through not having every one of them a copy of the Word of God for themselves. They acted in faith through promises that they would probably receive some of them 20 years previous when Abraham went to sacrifice his son. Many, many, many years he looked back and he saw the promise of God that he would be the father of many generations. And he, it records here, believed God enough that God would have to raise him from the dead because he was, he was the promised son. He was the proper child. He was the only begotten of Abraham, and so the promise had to come through him. In Isaac shall they see, but he called, the Bible says. According to that, God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. And by doing that, again, it says that word figure. They were acting out figures. They were acting out shadows of the truth. Even in the Old Testament tabernacle, there was a, a, a darkness, there was a haziness in their acting out of faith. And yet they did it, and yet so much the more. Why can't we? Why can't we today act out of faith? Hey, these are weightier matters. These are weightier matters that we need to act out, and that's just a few of the things we've talked about in this last little while. What